When you think of Latin America, you may think of tropical destinations, flavorful cuisine, or its diverse and vibrant culture. But there's big business happening here too. This is a program where we show you some of the industries driving the region's economy. Also, you'll meet the major players and decision makers leading the way. I'm Gabriela Frias and this is Marketplace Latin America. I'm coming to you from the city of Cartagena, Colombia. The walls of this port city were built in the 1700s to protect it from pirates. But over time, it has helped form a picturesque backdrop, perfect for movie makers. Films such as Love in the Time of Cholera with Javier Bardem and The Mission with Robert De Niro were filmed in this area. More recently, Will Smith filmed scenes here for his upcoming movie, The Gemini Man. Countrywide, Colombia is attracting more and more international film projects, and not just because of its scenery. The goal is deliver that package to here, mile 22. Mile 22, starring Mark Wahlberg, is an action-packed fiction set in Southeast Asia. Can I have all the motorcycle riders come over here? But most of it was filmed in Bogota, Colombia. They gave us like four blocks where we were blowing up cars and shooting a pretty big street fight. No! This was all kind of, you know, uh, off, the, off the grid territory for everyone. Peter Berg is one of the latest international directors lured to Colombia for filming. Somebody from the studio called me and said, would you go look at Bogota? And I... I I was, wasn't on my radar. And then my friend who produces Narcos, I talked to him, he's like, oh no, it's incredible. Thank you. And there are all these locations that have never been filmed in, and then you can get a good rebate. Colombia's rebate program, a.k.a. Law 1556, took effect in 2013. Feature films or TV movies can get 40% cash back on local production services like crews and extras. They can also get 20% back on logistic services such as catering, hotels and transportation. We wanted to have bigger films to have the, that experience Mexico or Brazil has had for ages. Django. Django. Pro Imágenes Colombia is a government-funded organization that administers the program. 32 films have gotten the rebate so far, including American Made with Tom Cruise and The 33 with Antonio Banderas. They have spent $60 million and the rebate has been total amount of around $18 million. The government first started investing in its film industry in 2003, when they created what's known as the Film Law. Colombia used to have only four films produced uh, per year. Now we are producing more than 40 films per year. So we really felt that the Film Law was the most important instrument uh, that gave us grants and gave us tax incentives that has allowed us to have a lot of films coming to our audiences. Right now, we're doing a TV commercial shoot. We're shooting at 1,000 frames per second. Congo Films rents most of the equipment to the big film productions in Colombia. Well, the first law was a big, huge force and a lot of uh, new uh, production came in. But when the second law, the, the rebate, came on, that was when production uh, not only doubled, but it was uh, three, four, five times as much as far as international production goes. Action. Pro Imágenes says 573 crew, 364 cast, and more than 15,000 extras were hired locally by films who earned the rebate. AG Studios Colombia is definitely the result of the Colombian rebate program. In the past three years, we've closed deals on $53 million. Seven feature films, four TV series. 
Now the industry, once only known for producing telenovelas, is growing and branching out. We were looking for the opportunity to developing a, a feature film. And finally this year we managed to do that. And it's going to put us in a different position in terms of um, feature films production. Telecolombia was founded more than 20 years ago. Fox International purchased a 51% share of the company in 2007. Now the studio wants to be on par with Hollywood. So all these facades and, and this backlot is very, very unique here in Colombia and I would say that even Latin America because although it's pretty common in LA, it's something that you won't see in this part of the, of the world. Not only are production facilities stepping it up, so is the talent. We opened up a school a year ago because the industry in Colombia has been growing so much that we need a lot more technicians, we need more directors, assistants, producers, sound people. At first everyone was very afraid to come to Colombia. I mean, is, is that going to be not safe? Is there going to be people capable to deal with these bigger projects? Uh, is there talent there? What we have um, proved is that when once they get here, like in five occasions, they have spent more than 50% of what they uh, initially said they were going to spend because it's cheaper or easier to do it here. Action. The hope is that trend will continue and more big international productions will realize they can get a lot more bang for their buck in Colombia. Projected that Latin America may triple its car fleet to more than 250 million vehicles by the year 2050. For mainly environmental and fuel saving reasons, countries are setting up goals to make sure that many of those vehicles are electric. Latin America has the chance to play a major role in producing electric vehicles because the region is the source of a very key element. White salt, resembling snow, covers the ground for miles here in this northern region of Argentina. That salt is enriched with a mineral that is as good as gold to some companies. This is the Minera XR mining site in Jujuy province, where they are planning one of the largest lithium production projects in the region. We are going to produce 25,000 tons of lithium carbonate. In this phase, we are going to invest around 430 million, and, and we are now uh, in the construction ponds. Minera XR is partially owned by Canadian company Lithium Americas. Just recently, China's Ganfeng Lithium announced plans to buy a 50% stake in the company from Chile's SQM for nearly $90 million. If we take from the, the lithium price in 2015, the price was around uh, 6,500 US dollar per ton. And today the industry has a different uh, price. They are increasing the price around 12,000 to 13,000 US per ton. But the principal reason is the new electrification of the cars and, and, and many other areas of the industry. Lithium is a key ingredient for the rechargeable batteries used in cell phones and many electric vehicles. Deutsche Bank predicts demand for lithium will grow 14% per year through 2025 as electric vehicle sales surge. That brings a lot more attention to this area. We find lithium in a place that we, we call the Lithium Triangle, which is located in between northwest Argentina, northern Chile and southwest Bolivia. And in, in, in this particular region of the world, it is estimated that roughly up to 80% of, of lithium-containing brines could be located. 
but the process isn't easy and can take up to two years. The brine is pumped out from the underground reservoirs and it's poured into huge open air evaporation ponds. And these evaporation ponds are roughly the size of a football field. Because the brine gets concentrated, then the different salts containing the brine slowly precipitate, slowly crystallize. And once the brine has been concentrated, uh, enough concentrated, we do a relatively easy chemical treatment. So we, we add soda ash and we precipitate lithium carbonate, which is um, the raw material, uh, the pure raw material that we would like um, to commercialize. Victoria Flexer and her team at this research center in Jujuy are trying to discover new ways to work with lithium. We would like to be able to process and to, to add value to this resource, not only to be a raw material producer, but also to be able to add value to our raw materials and add some, some, some value to what we do in the country. As the world's third largest lithium producer, Argentina currently generates about 30,000 tons of lithium per year. That's less than half the output of Australia and neighboring Chile, but new investments may close that gap. Jurídicamente, Argentina ofrece condiciones bastante más favorables que Chile y que Bolivia. Argentina offers quite more favorable conditions than Chile or Bolivia for the settlement of foreign companies. There's been an explicit interest shown by European companies, by Russian companies, not only concerning lithium, but also potassium, which are related components in the salt flats. So the existing demand is concentrated mainly in China, Japan, South Korea and Europe, and in the United States. There are at least five international companies, including the Minar XR project, that plan to produce about 200,000 tons of lithium in coming years. And many hope that it won't be just foreign investors who benefit from this search. Yo creo que... I believe we are creating a kind of proactive and positive relationship between company and community. Because it's not only the economic effect of money flows, but there's a whole social growth resulting from people beginning to feel that remaining in their homeland gives them a chance of a better life. Like this one you see taking up here at the Rafael Nunez International Terminal is made up of millions of complex parts. More and more of those parts are being manufactured in Mexico. In fact, aerospace exports from Mexico were worth an estimated 8 billion US dollars in 2017. That's up more than 150% from 2008. We set out to discover what's causing this industry to take off. Francisco begins another day of university classes with his sights set on becoming an electronic engineer. It's a dream that began gazing up at the sky. I always felt emotional watching a plane take off and thinking about how they did it. For me, it was incredible that something so heavy and so, so big could take off. That is what motivated me. At just 22 years old, this young student is part of a boom that few might have imagined. From 2009 to 2017, Mexico's aerospace industry increased its share of GDP by 152%. And from 1999 to 2016, more than $3 billion of foreign investment has landed here. Now there are 330 international and national companies manufacturing components across the country. Five states in particular are at the center of this growth. Baja California, Sonora, Chihuahua, Nuevo León, and here in Querétaro, an aerospace hub where the industry is soaring. Querétaro has a lot of universities. There are between 15 to 20, and this has attracted a lot of companies. We came here because human capital is fundamental for sectors such as aerospace. We need specialized skills and engineers. Here at the Aeronautic University in Querétaro, more than 1,700 students like Francisco are immersed in the latest technology. It's a 10-year-old institution where students learn everything from painting a plane to rebuilding an engine turbine. And it's located right in the middle of an aerospace corridor that boasts the biggest names in the industry. Like Bombardier, which has invested $500 million in this plant over the last 13 years. 
An Airbus, which just announced plans to build a $12 million helicopter maintenance facility next door to its existing facility. I've seen the demand grow uh, with, uh, again, there's an advantage because of the cost of labor, but at the same time, there's been a willingness from the clusters, from the government, to provide the resources, to provide the infrastructures for us, the foreign investors, to come here and set up shop. 90% of Mexican aircraft parts are exported to Europe and the United States. The challenge is to convert Mexico into a hub that assembles the entire aircraft on Mexican soil. The Mexican government and global aeronautic corporations recently gathered in Querétaro to chart the map forward. We're looking for um, greater development of Mexican companies. A lot of our partners here are foreign companies that have invested in Mexico. That's great. They've ha helped develop capabilities here in Mexico. They work well with the Mexican labor force. But again, I think we need to see more direct Mexican activity in the aerospace industry. Mexican companies have stepped up to automotive. So the new frontier is, is aerospace. By some estimates, annual exports will reach $12.25 billion by the year 2021. And while the industry continues to soar, Francisco is investing in his ticket to the future. My dream is to develop and build instruments that can be installed on aircraft that will make them more efficient and more reliable. carrier Gol Airlines had its first flight take off in 2001. Today there are more than a hundred aircraft in its fleet and 700 flights take off daily. Shasta Darlington spoke to the company's CEO about the airline's path to profitability. Here is also a kind of historical place because this hangar was built in 1950. So you actually took uh, flight lessons when you started this job, right? Yes. Yeah, that was the first thing I decided to do in combination with uh, uh, flying every week with our customers in order to have the look and feel of their experience. The company is the output of a very bright idea created 17 years ago by a family pretty much experienced in, in customer transportation in Brazil by buses and they found out a huge opportunity. Brazil didn't have at that time no low-cost carrier and there was a regulation change which allowed newcomers to establish their enterprises uh, without having the necessity of establishing a fixed price. So that was year 2000. And then in 2001, the Constantino family in Brazil ignited that idea and created the today's uh, largest airline in the country. What did people say? Did they expect it to be a success? By the beginning, just to give you an idea, I, I believe that not even the, the owners, the family, they, they believed that the success would be that big uh, made in the first years. Uh, if you consider the company's CAGR, the, the growth rate in the first 10 years, it was at a level of 15 to 17 percent every year. So the company started holding six planes, flying to seven to eight destinations in Brazil, and then uh, 10 years later, we were already reaching 33, 34 percent of the Brazilian domestic market. 2012 was uh, an interesting year for you. That's when you came on board. Yeah. Uh, tell me about the specific challenges you faced at that point and what you implemented to address those challenges. The company was the second in the market and had a clear potential to achieve even uh, higher goals. So since 2012, we decided to implement a, a new uh, strategic platform which uh, challenged ourselves to keep and protect our market leadership among the leisure travelers, those are more uh, price driven to, to decide uh, on, on the different airline options. And uh, on top of it, attract more business travelers. We created two economic classes, the standard one and the Go Plus Comfort, offering more legroom to, to the customers and reclining the seats 50% more than we did before. And we also redesigned completely our onboard service we uh, implemented the Wi-Fi 
live TV on board, and we created two uh, domestic launches. Uh, just to mention some of the product changes that the company has successfully implemented. Gold just posted its second quarter uh, results, posted a loss. Can you talk about what is at play there? This is a, the second quarter is a very good example to better explain the volatility in the Brazilian market and how this uh, exchange rate aspect does affect the accounting results. We, at the same time that we delivered the second quarter a positive operating result, which is a, a, a quite considerable achievement, considering that the second quarter is low season in Brazil, so typically the airlines are delivering negative results. But within these three months, this period, there was a huge exchange rate to the valuation in comparison to, to the dollar. These yeah. losses are, are basically accounting effect than uh, rather than operating losses. We are operating 120 planes. We have ordered uh, another 135 new planes, wow. the 737 MAX 8, and the expectation was really high. You can imagine that the, the, the new generation is supposed to save 15% in fuel consumption, which is a lot. Uh, mainly considering that in Brazil, the jet fuel price has a huge tax uh, on it and and also that's uh, another reason why we keep a pretty modern fleet the average age of, of, of our fleet is around seven years how would you describe gold today if it started out wanting to be a low-cost carrier what yeah. is it today uh, our our mission uh, public said is to be the first for all and the first for all uh, is not related to the market leadership only because this is the position we are holding but to be the the company firstly reminded or, or preferred by uh, everybody and we are basically operating in every meaningful market in, in South America we uh, intend to bring the same concept that made the company so successful in Brazil to new markets in South America, the, the Caribbean, uh, and Central America, south, southeast uh, of the United States too. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to look out for another episode of Marketplace Latin America in November. Until then, adios.